Pushkin. Revisionist History is presented by Lexus. Wherever you may go, there's a Lexus for every road. As the world slowly begins to reopen, Lexus once again looks to people for inspiration, asking a simple question that's been on everyone's mind. Of all the places you're looking forward to, where will you go first? Will it be familiar streets or perhaps unknown roads? Wherever you go, whenever you're ready, Lexus will welcome you back with exceptional offers on exceptional vehicles. Find a Lexus for every road at Lexus.com. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. Starting today, if you don't live in New York State, you're going to have to pay a mandatory entrance fee to visit the Metropolitan Museum. Eyewitness News, ABC7 New York, March 1st, 2018. The new policy was announced in January, but it took effect today. Adults who do not have ID proving that they live right here in New York have to pay $25. Seniors will pay $17. If I had to pinpoint the beginning of my obsession with art museums, it would be the moment the Metropolitan Museum, one of the greatest museums in the world, decided to impose entrance fees. It was a difficult time for the institution. They had a $40 million deficit. They got rid of 90 employees. Exhibitions were canceled. There was a shakeup in the leadership. Up and down the Upper East Side of Manhattan, there was hand-wringing and a great gnashing of teeth. I remember one New York Times headline from that time. Is the Met Museum a great institution in decline? That was followed by one expression of anguish after another, including this from the former chairman of the Met's Drawings and Print Department. To have inherited a museum as strong as the Met was 10 years ago, with a great curatorial staff, and to have it be what it is today, is unimaginable. Well, exactly. Because, for the life of me, I couldn't imagine how it was the Met was crying poverty. I mean, they have one of the largest and most valuable art collections in the world. 1.5 million objects. What's all that art worth? I don't know, $100 billion? More? The Met might be the richest nonprofit institution in human history. All they would have to do is pick a couple things off the shelf and they'd never see a deficit again. This is like Jeff Bezos firing the gardener because he's out of cash. Just go to the ATM, Jeff. But they couldn't do it. They would rather fire people and make a family of four cough up to $100 at the gate than even think of parting with a single one of their possessions. Why? It's a puzzle. And it is for puzzles like this that we have revisionist history. My name is Malcolm Gladwell. You're listening to my podcast about things overlooked and misunderstood. This is our fifth season, five years of digression, high dudgeon, needless provocation, and my absolute favorite, Grand Unified Theories. In this season of Revisionist History, I want to explore our emotional attachment to objects and rituals and tradition and the way in which those attachments betray us. And in this first episode, I would like to make sense of the strange relationship of the art world to art. During his 31-year tenure as director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Philippe de Montebello, the Met's eighth and longest-serving director, guided the acquisition of more than 84,000 works of art. I found this in a video series called Great Museums, an episode from 2010, An Acquiring Mind. Lots of wide-angle shots of marble-floored galleries and gilt frame paintings. NPR's Susan Stamberg narrates over what sounds like an orchestra right there on the set. Born in France, educated at Harvard, in 1963, de Montebello brought a background in European painting. The film runs for an hour. 
It's about the most famous director of the Met, Philippe de Montebello, descendant of a noble French family. In particular, it's about how much stuff Philippe de Montebello bought during his 31-year tenure as head of the Met. Tapestries, African sculptures, a fabulous Vermeer, an evening gown that's to die for. He even bought things he didn't want to buy. Philippe has been an incredible director for supporting the acquisitions of objects of great quality from across the globe. It goes on and on about the acquiring, to the point where you wonder, or at least I wondered, wait, I thought you didn't have any money. Today, nearly two million objects, comprising an encyclopedic treasury of world art, are contained in the Met's growing collection. Apparently, I was wrong in the numbers. Not 1.5 million objects, 2 million objects. Let me give you an example, maybe my favorite example, of this weirdness in the art world. It has to do with a public hearing held in July of 1991 at the Financial Accounting Standards Board, better known as the FASB. The FASB is the Vatican of the American accounting profession, and this was one of the occasional open sessions the FASB holds in order to share with the broader American public subjects of grave concern to the accounting universe. The venue was the FASB's Norwalk, Connecticut headquarters. The subject, accounting for contributions received and contributions made and capitalization of works of art, historical treasures, and similar assets. The room was packed. They videotaped the proceedings so people could watch in the overflow room. I've read a transcript of the hearing, all 947 pages of it, and I would like to direct your attention to a particular exchange. It was between the then chairman of the FASB, Dennis Beresford, and a man named C. Douglas Dillon. Dillon was a tall man, gray suit, patrician, a certain stature. He was former director of Dillon Reed & Co., the Wall Street firm founded by his father, and was possessed of maybe the greatest resume in mid-century America. U.S. Treasury Secretary for much of the 1960s, ambassador to France, chair of the Brookings Foundation, president of the Harvard Board of Overseers, a close friend of John Rockefeller III, a world-class collector of Impressionist art, and, most relevant for the purposes of the hearing that day, chairman of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. The American establishment sent its biggest gun to confront the FASB over the agency's proposal to change the rules surrounding the accounting for contributions received and contributions made and capitalization of works of art, historical treasures, and similar assets. The accountants wanted the art world to follow the same accounting rules as other businesses. Dillon versus Dennis Beresford, chairman of the FASB, member of the American Accounting Hall of Fame and the Financial Executives International Hall of Fame. Way back on day one of the proceedings in question, Beresford had made it plain that he wasn't going to stand for any nonsense. So C. Douglas Dillon was restrained in his objections. Gracious. I'm going to guess this was his first visit to Norwalk, Connecticut. The room must have been hushed, right? I mean, it's C. Douglas freaking Dillon. He does a little preamble, carefully explains how outraged the Met is at the intrusion of accountants into their business, launches into a vivid description of the extraordinary size of the Met's collection, and then, and this is maybe my favorite part of the entire 947-page transcript, Dylan says, quote, We have a new curator of Islamic art, been with us for a couple years now. We have certainly the greatest collection of Islamic rugs in the Western Hemisphere, one of the two or three in the world. He has never been able to even see that collection because so much of it is in storage and is so difficult to get out, so costly and time-consuming that he knows by the records what they are, but he hasn't been able to look at them. C. Douglas Dillon is speaking to an audience of accountants. Accountants are people who like to count things. More than that, they are people who believe, as a matter of deep professional principle, that everything can be counted. 
and they have proposed that the art world agree to start counting things like everyone else. And in response, this pillar of the American establishment shows up in suburban Connecticut and says, we can't count our things. There's just too many of them. They're all buried somewhere in storage. To give you an example, the guy who was responsible for our Islamic rug collection, maybe the greatest Islamic rug collection in the world, mind you, has never even seen our Islamic rug collection. I have to say, this is where the art world loses me. So I called up the staffer at the FASB who organized that hearing all those long years ago. His name is Ron Basio, just retired. Um, this is a good exercise for a 73-year-old to test the memory, to go back yes, to almost I'm 30 very, years I'm, now. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very impressed. <laughs> Basio returned to his old offices at FASB headquarters to take my call, so he would have access to the critical documents. So I'm just going to pull up the uh, financial statements of the Metropolitan Museum, and I want to just want to very briefly walk through... Uh, I, was just, I was just wondering if they could be Googled up here as well. Yeah, maybe we can build. He's on his computer. I'm on mine. We're downloading the Metropolitan Museum of Art's 2019 annual report and locating the crucial part, the statements of financial position, beginning on page 44. I have cash, receivable for investments sold, retail inventories. These are all straightforward. Accounts receivable, straightforward. Contributions receivable. And That's they, the pledges. Financial statements for almost any organization look pretty much the same. You start by listing your assets, everything of value. Then you list your liabilities, loans, mortgages, pension obligations. Then you balance them. That's why it's called a balance sheet. Basio and I are going down the list of the Met's assets. Then there's investments, which I'm assuming is the endowment. 3.7. Could be endowment or it could be uh, just investments in total. They may not yeah. all be part of the endowment. Then I have fixed assets, $393 million, and then I have collections and I have nothing. It's supposed to be a precise accounting of everything the Met has of value. The amount the museum made last year from selling stocks. The amount of cash it has on hand. It's endowment. The amount it's owed from various creditors. The amount it got in gifts and donations, even the value of the inventory in its gift shop, everything. And they add it all up, and they come up with a number, total assets. But next to the line item entitled collections, that is to say, the millions of unimaginably rare and precious art objects owned by the museum, the 18 Van Goghs, the 46 Picassos, the 20 Rembrandts, there is no dollar figure, nothing. It's blank. All it says is C note A. Okay, note A. Ah, here it is. Note A in the appendix. It says, in conformity with accounting policies generally followed by art museums, the value of the museum's collections has been excluded from the statement of financial position. Excluded. This is a multi-billion dollar organization with yes. billions and billions of... <laughs> dollars in art, and it's, none of it is listed on their, in their financial statement? This seems, I don't even, I was, I don't even understand how that started. Well, that was, your reaction is similar to the reaction that some of our board members had. On top of that, it turns out that the Met would rather charge admission, cut exhibitions, and get rid of 90 people than sell anything. Even though they have so many things like Islamic rugs, that the guy running the Islamic rug collection hasn't even seen any of his Islamic rugs because they're all in storage somewhere. In fact, most of the Mets collection is in storage. Huge, football field-sized warehouses, presumably somewhere in New Jersey, full of stuff. And when the FASB says, why don't you tell us, like a normal institution, just how much your stuff is worth because, I don't know, Maybe it would be easier to think rationally about how to run things if you knew that fact. The Met goes crazy. Dispatches C. Douglas Dillon to Norwalk, Connecticut to say, never, not on my watch. We've never done that and we never will. Yeah, this is unlike any other business. Uh, you, you're supposed to carry assets at either book or market value. 
and you're supposed to put them in your financial reports, and they don't. This is Michael O'Hare, who teaches in the business school at Berkeley. If you ask anyone, anyone who knows their way around a balance sheet about the way museums record their assets, you get the Michael O'Hare response. I was talking about this at some conference, and somebody from an orchestra, some financial person from an orchestra, said, wait a minute, you mean you buy a painting and then it just disappears? And that's what happens. There's, there's an expense, and then that's the last we hear about it in the financial records. It's quite, uh, it's quite bizarre. For the longest time, I would bore everyone I met with how strange I found all this. Until one day, I was in Holland on my book tour in Leiden, out with a bunch of people in a bar. And I told the group the story of the epic showdown between Dennis Beersford and C. Douglas Dillon. And this one guy, a philosopher, said, oh, it's like Smog. Smog, the dragon from The Hobbit, who sits on a mountain of treasure. Smog doesn't want to use his gold. He doesn't wear it out to dragon social events. He does not list his holdings on his annual dragon financial statement. He just wants to hoard it. And I'm like, oh my God. Smog. Yes, that explains everything. There was an old dragon and a gray stone. His red eyes blinked as he lay alone. His joy was dead and his youth spent. He was knobbed and wrinkled and his limbs bent in the long years to his gold chain. In his heart's furnace the fire waned. This is J.R.R. Tolkien, reading his poem, The Horde. To his belly slime gems stuck thick, silver and gold he would snuff and lick. To his belly slime gems stuck thick. That's what happens when a dragon sits on his treasure for too long. And the stuff that couldn't fit under his belly, the dragon has buried deep inside his lair, in storage. As the world slowly begins to reopen, Lexus once again looks to people for inspiration, asking a simple question that's been on everyone's mind. Of all the places you're looking forward to, where will you go first? Will it be familiar streets or perhaps unknown roads? Or cruising down grand boulevards? Exploring lanes along the coast or long interstate highways? Or maybe a journey starts on a main drag and ends on an off-the-beaten path. Wherever you go, there's a Lexus for every road. And whether it be today, tomorrow, or even next month, whenever you're ready, Lexus will welcome you back with exceptional offers on exceptional vehicles. Find out all the ways a Lexus can be yours at Lexus.com. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. I don't know if you've ever heard of the old adage, the minute a company moves into a fancy new headquarters, it's all over. It's the surest sign they've peaked and gotten fat and lazy. We're two years old and we're about to move into these insanely fancy new offices, 25 employees, and we're already on this massive real estate ego trip. And who's leading the trip? I am. I go to our CEO, Jacob Weisberg, and I say, I'm gonna need a huge, budget for furniture, because we're like the Tiffany of podcast studios, only the best. And I decided I'm going to get it all at article.com, because they sent me some stuff as a freebie, and it was gorgeous. So I'm thinking, let's go first class. I need stylish mid-century modern chairs, elegant desks, some patio furniture for the exquisite Walden Garden, right? Scandinavian, industrial, bohemian. So I go on article.com, and I come away devastated. You know why? because it's not expensive. I'm on a power trip. Our CEO has given me a massive budget and there's no way I can spend it all at Article. What's going on? Turns out Article has no middleman, no showrooms, no salespeople, no retail markup, which allows them to keep their quality super high and their prices super low. So low that you can get anything you want at Article, except a power trip. Fast, affordable shipping is available across the USA and Canada and is free on orders over 999. 
All in-stock items are delivered in two weeks or less. Article is offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Go to article.com slash Gladwell and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash Gladwell to get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Article. Price is so low you can get everything you want except an ego trip. Following that epiphany in the bar in Leiden, I resolved to perform a field test of the hypothesis that art museums are modern-day versions of the dragon's smog. This was a few months back. I was going to be in Pittsburgh for another reason anyway, so I decided to pay a visit to the Andy Warhol Museum, the largest museum devoted to a single artist in North America. So I made an appointment with the museum's curator of art, Jessica Beck, And on a bright and cold morning in Pittsburgh, I headed out to the city's North Shore neighborhood to the beautiful old warehouse that holds the museum. I told Beck I didn't want to see just the collection, the art on the walls. I wanted to see everything. So Beck graciously took me upstairs to the archives. We're just off the staircase. There were dozens of brown cardboard boxes stacked in neat piles. Oh, I see. Oh, they're like... They're covered in plastic and, um, you know, kept... Behind glass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, again, is just a portion of them. There's a whole other portion yeah. in Wait, how many are here? Let's see. Um, the cardboard boxes house what Warhol called his time capsules. There are 610 of them okay. in total. He would put things in these cardboard boxes, tape them shut, okay. and set them aside. But he also had other boxes, idea boxes, what are called basement boxes. After Warhol died, everything was shipped to Pittsburgh in an armada of tractor trailers. The museum's best guess is that in their archive, they have at least 500,000 objects. And so the, all the other boxes are behind that door. Yeah, the rest of them are, yeah. are back there. Yeah, but it's not, it's not something I can see. <laughs> um, that I'm not sure. And yeah. I can ask, we can find out, because I wasn't sure it's maybe We found one of Warhol's time capsules that had been opened. It was on the counter, like a patient etherized upon a table. We peered inside. So this is his 50s suit. Oh, 1956, Hong Kong. Yeah. So his first trip to Asia. A lot of them are closed right now because we're sort of trying to figure out uh, how to keep the objects from shifting. (laughs) I was suddenly curious. I wanted to see inside one of the closed boxes. Beck said she didn't have the authority to open one up, but she made a few calls. Finally, she found someone. Oh, okay, we have someone that can open a box. Oh, good. Let's go take a look. (laughs) Another of the museum's staff hurried towards us. This is John. Hi, John. Hi, how are you Malcolm. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So we were just going to peek into one just to get a sense of what they look like. Pick one at random. I was was explaining, you know, that a lot of things are in folders, but... um, So they're, they're heavy. Yeah. Uh, they're, you know, like weigh 40 or 50 pounds in some cases. Mm-hmm. John positioned himself in front of the box and began opening it up. His movements were assured, practiced. So, yeah, we treat the uh, box itself like it's part of a, an object. Mm-hmm. So that's why I wear the gloves. So these would have been boxes that uh, Andy uh, would have his assistant store things in. And we've taken the time to uh, line the boxes with this uh, folder-type material mm-hmm. so that the objects in the box do not uh, touch the acidic cardboard of the original box. And they're kind of packaged very... Uh, objects in here are packaged in a sort of a Tetris kind of way uh, with uh, folders that are marked mm-hmm. and cataloged. So in its original form, this stuff would have been... Uh, Just crammed in there. I wasn't sure what I was expecting to see in the box. Drawings, notes, makeshift sculptures, old canvases, the working life of an artist. So this is a pretty cool one, a lenticular of the uh, daisies. Mm -hmm. Did he make that, or is that just something he bought? Uh, That was probably something he bought. Yeah. At best, he would have commissioned it. 
to be made. But I think this was something that was purchased and then used as an inspiration for his later work. And, and you can smell it, right? Do you, do you smell that? That's, yeah. that's the object itself, off-gassing. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the lenticular is one of those pieces of cardboard with an image on it that's printed in such a way that it looks like it has three dimensions. They're big with children. This one had flowers on it. Yeah. Sometimes we find like notes, uh, like well, the Andy's intent, like why he was collecting these, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. along with the objects that you know we consider sort of source material. Yeah. So he's got like six lenticulars in that. Yep. In that top folder. Mm -hmm. along with John continued digging deeper and deeper into the same box. We found an old movie scrapboard that once belonged to a fan somewhere. A bunch of 8x10 glossies of movie stars. Clark Gable, Bing Crosby, Basile Ball. Do you want to go one more folder? Um, yeah, let's do, we'll do one last, fold, one last folder, it'd be cool. We looked at a piece of what seemed like junk mail, an invite to an art opening. So we even keep the paper clips. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see, so it's yeah. quite meticulous. Yeah. yeah, everything is kept. It's done in warehouse. Mm -hmm. John started whispering. It seemed appropriate. We were deep in the dragon's lair. Now, why are Andy Warhol's time capsules full of junk? Because he collected junk. Well, if you wanted to meet Andy Warhol, all you had to do in the 80s was go to the flea market, um, the 6th Avenue flea market. I'm in New York talking with Simon Doonan, Writer, fashionista. In fact, I just word searched flea market in the Warhol diaries and it comes up about 12 times because he's always going to, coming from, blah, blah, blah. I've known Simon ever since he wrote a book called Eccentric Glamour years ago, which included chapters on Simone de Beauvoir, Tilda Swinton, the supermodel Iman, and me, which remains the most preposterously inaccurate but nonetheless deeply flattering thing anyone has ever written about me. I love Simon Doonan. Anyway, back in the day, Simon knew Andy Warhol and the flea market where he hung out. It was a protean flea market. <laughs> it kept growing, expanding, retreating. Anytime there was a new lot available, the flea market expanded. And it was a significant social scene. Like, I remember seeing Catherine Deneuve there, and it was just a, a place that you went if you were in New York. It was a way of, you know, checking everybody out, meeting your friends. We were in Simon's apartment, an impossibly chic worn of rooms. I could walk you around and show you many things that Jonathan and I, or I myself, bought at the 6th Avenue Flea Market. That bust of Michael Jackson, which people think is a Jeff Koons, was 10 bucks yeah. at the flea market. People really think it was a Jeff Koons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you told Jeff Koons? <laughs> Simon Doonan found treasure at the flea market. Everyone did. But Warhol treated his treasure a little differently. When Andy Warhol died, it emerged that he had um, not unpacked most of this stuff that he'd gotten at the flea market. There were these stories, I think, in Vanity Fair about his house, packed with shopping bags that he'd gotten uh, at the flea market when he bought his Russell Wright china he collected. He collected those cookie jars. Famously, he would buy those Toysha chocolates uh, he was obsessed with them, but he would chew them and spit them out, you know, because he was always very concerned about keeping his um, trim little figure. So the idea that he collected these big sort of rotund cookie jars to be stuffed with cookies, it's kind of hilarious because he was sort of, you know, always very conscious of his, um, his figure. Andy Warhol was a hoarder. All the classic symptoms. Simon Doonan used to head up the window dressing department at Barney's, and he famously did a homage to Warhol after his death, entitled The Compulsive Collector. We took the mannequin, dressed him in jeans, the blue blazer, turtleneck, and then I just went and bought one of those tacky Warhol wigs that you could get at a Halloween store, put the glasses on him, and instantly it, it became Andy, to the point where Pat Hackett, who wrote the Warhol Diaries, was sort of 
you know, skipping down 7th Avenue and screeched to a halt. And she banged on the window. She said to me, I nearly had a heart attack. I thought Andy would come back from the dead. <laughs> but I could show you the window. Simon brought out a book filled with pictures of his most famous windows. Oh, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. You can see it looks oh just goodness. like him. It's it. just like him. And all around the mannequin was stuff. The exact same kind of stuff that later found its way into the boxes at the Warhol Museum. The definition of a collector is someone who collects objects discriminately. Someone who selects and chooses. But as Simon so nicely put it, Andy Warhol was a compulsive collector. His collecting was indiscriminate. And what happens when he dies and his indiscriminate collection passes into the hands of a museum? They don't edit it or streamline it. They keep it exactly as it was, hidden away behind locked doors. The Warhol Museum is an indiscriminate collection of an indiscriminate collection. The special thing about it, I think, is that it feels like it could be detritus in any other situation, right? Like remains of a day. Like there's, you know, um, the flight kit you would get on a first class international flight, like the slippers, the vomit bag, the silverware from that international flight, like in one of the time capsules. So it's it's this like sense of Warhol when you're with the material. But then again, it's it's not, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we even have the box after he died uh, at the hospital of his clothing and his final effects that were left at the hospital. We have that box preserved as it was picked up from the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it had um, his jacket in it that he wore to the um, hospital for that final visit, the backpack exactly how it was packed. So it has like all of his glasses and the business card for his doctor in the front pocket. Now, I don't mean to pick on the Warhol Museum. This is what all art museums do. During his tenure running the Met, Philippe de Montebello acquired 84,000 objects, the overwhelming majority of which were packed away in boxes and sent to storage in New Jersey, never to be seen again. That's not any different from the mountain of detritus in cardboard boxes upstairs at the Warhol Museum. I have a confession to make. I'm obsessed with running. Every evening after I finish with work, I hit the roads or the track or do hills in my backyard. It's what keeps me sane and fills me with joy. And that's why I'm here to tell you about my favorite running brand in the whole world, Tracksmith, a Boston-based company built on a deep love for the sport, led by a group of lifelong runners who are dedicated to building beautiful, cutting-edge apparel from the world's finest performance materials. They have pieces designed for specific running needs, whether that's the perfect short for a hot and sweaty long run, or a lightweight tee that offers UV protection and won't smell after your workout is done. Just so you know, because I know people get a little cynical about ads. I was wearing Tracksmith long before Tracksmith decided to advertise on Revisionist History. I genuinely love this stuff. When I found out that a merino wool long sleeve tee that I really loved was out of stock, I tracked down the Tracksmith CEO and complained to him in person. That's how obsessed I am. And that's why it's the only running gear I wear. Learn more at tracksmith.com slash revisionist history and use code GLADWELL at checkout for $15 off your first order of $75 or more. Somewhere in the United States, there are twin brothers. I don't know precisely where they live, but in a big city. Can you just sort of describe them? They're, they're not married, I take it. They're not married. The psychologist Randy Frost, who worked closely with them for some time, refers to them as Alvin and Jerry, both pseudonyms. Born into a wealthy family, childhood prodigies, rumpled suits and bow ties. These are two people that I really liked intensely. The brothers lived in adjoining identical penthouse apartments in a hotel, each with an 800-square-foot great room with double-height ceilings. And each brother had filled his great room with things. I'm quoting now from Frost's account of the case. 
from a book he co-authored called Stuff. Every square foot of the great room and dining room was packed with works of art and period furniture, 18th and 19th century paintings, sculptures, busts, antiques, lamps, jewelry, and more, end quote. They had no pathways between all of their stuff. You stepped over things as you walked. Some of the piles were six feet high. On top of the art were clothes everywhere, and papers, business cards, bits of junk. They were lovely. They were intense in what they did. They they had this kind of bond as, as twins, but tension at the same time. Uh, fascinating, fascinating characters. And really very interested in this phenomenon for themselves. This phenomenon, meaning hoarding, Frost began to study hoarding behaviors with the assumption that they sprang from the same place as obsessive compulsive disorders. But the more he worked with hoarders, the more he became convinced that description didn't fit. OCD behavior is about the catastrophic reaction to an intrusive thought. And those intrusive thoughts are negative, danger, threat, contamination. But so much of hoarding appeared to be the opposite. It appeared to be about pleasure. One of the brothers, Alvin, would come home for lunch nearly every day just to be among his things. Not to organize, but to enjoy. Frost would go with him on some of those visits, and Alvin would walk through the chaos, pick up random objects, and describe the story behind each one of his treasures. Look at this, doctor. His voice rose with excitement as he found a ring. The ring, he thought, was from western India. It was huge, almost the size of a walnut. It's just that lovely scene in the book when you're walking through Alvin's apartment with him, and he's picking up objects. Yeah, and, yeah. But many of those objects have genuine value. Many of them did. Some of them didn't. Some of them didn't. And it reminded me a little bit of uh, Andy Warhol because he collected things uh, in in this way and things with immense value and things of no value and put them all into into these treasure chests. Yeah, yeah. Was Alvin aware, he must have been aware intellectually of what was marketplace valuable and what was yes. not. Yes, yes. It's just that it was all a value to him. It was all value to him, yeah. 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 And he had no desire, he didn't want to show off his... No treasures in any way. No. Frost says that the impulse to hoard has three motivations. There's one is instrumental. That is, I might need it someday. The other is emotional. That is, this emotional connection with another person or event or something. And the third is aesthetic. This idea of the beauty of the physical world. The second of those ideas, the emotional one, Frost describes as the Proust effect, from the famous passage in Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. He's eating this cookie, and all of a sudden, he, it brings him back to his childhood when his aunt used to make these cookies for him, and he remembers the way it felt. A little bit like, the phenomena is, is like hearing a song from your childhood. What started to dawn on me was that it, with people with this problem, these objects form that kind of an experience in a much more intense way than everybody else. So somehow these objects are keys to these visceral memories that get produced. So finding something, anything, some token, some memento, anything that from your past triggers an, a, a much more vivid recollection exactly. than, in, than in the rest of us. Than, than for the rest of us, yes. Yeah. And, and it is... A, a recollection. So, so let me, hold on. This is such a fascinating notion. So, you mentioned music. So, most of us would have it. You know, there are songs. If you play them, yes, have that. Yeah. Thing for me. Yes, only you. I don't know why that song does it for me, but I can yeah. imagine. So, what you're saying is that feeling I have with Yes, only you, only with a book of matches, bo yes. box of matches, or a absolutely yes, a playbill, yes. or a yes. One of Frost's patients was a woman who couldn't throw away a Disney blanket that her daughter had loved as a small child. Because she feels like if she throws it away, she will lose the memories associated with that blanket and she will lose that piece of history, her personal history. And, and if she throws away too much, there's nothing well, uh, left of her. For another patient, 
It was one of those ATM cash envelopes from five years ago. There was no cash in it. She spent the cash that was in it. But on the back, she'd written how she spent it. And it wasn't anything unusual, grocery store, drugstore, a few other items. She put it in the re recycle box and she started to cry. And she said, um, it feels like I'm losing that day in my life. And if I lose too much, there'll be nothing left of me. There'll be nothing left of me. One of the twin brothers, Alvin, was a successful event organizer. He once told Frost that he had lost a folder containing his notes from something he'd organized. And even though the event was recent, every memory he'd had of it was gone. And when he found the folder again, his memories returned. If your mind works that way, why would you ever throw away that folder? Most people would look at this and see a mess, he told Frost on one of their visits to his penthouse. And then he said, really, it's layered and complex. Their penthouses were so overwhelmed with stuff that they had to live elsewhere, in smaller rooms in the hotel, which were also overwhelmed with stuff. But they couldn't part with any of it. It would be too great a loss. They didn't want to itemize it or put it on their balance sheet or show the world. I'm sure they had their own Islamic rugs buried somewhere in their great room, which they had never seen. When you got them away from there, from the subject of hoarding and away mm -hmm. from their apartments, yeah, I mean, what were they like? Oh, they were they were fun. They were fascinating. They knew something about everything. They were both delightful, delightful people. If if you talk to a layperson, they would probably think of hoarding as a kind of mental illness. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining mm -hmm. it's not a mental illness. It's not a it's not a deficit that affects it all aspects of your functioning. Yeah. The way I describe it sometimes is a form of giftedness. There, there's a gift associated with this, an appreciation for the physical world, the, an appreciation for the emotional experience that's associated with objects. And, and that, that gift, unfortunately, comes with a curse. And, and the curse is not being able to manage it. The hoarder is someone with the unusual ability to see beauty in the ordinary, which is exactly the point that Simon Doonan made about Andy Warhol. The nicest aspect of him was that he was very democratic. Example, mm. he said, if everyone's not a beauty, then nobody is. Oh, that's kind of lovely. It's fabulous. It's yeah. like that's why he thought these, these drag queens you know, Jackie Curtis and Holly Woodlawn were not objectively Sophia Loren, but he saw beauty and magic and madness in them, you know. You know what, but Simon, that is the perfect illustration of the particular condition, wonderful condition of the hoarder, who, who applies that same logic to objects. If oh every God, object yes. is, not, uh, is not beautiful, then no object is. Right? It's exactly the same. Like some crappy old broken toy is the same as an Art Nouveau vase that your grandmother left you. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that oh is the... Oh my God, that's haunting. It is, isn't it? Haunting. And it's why the Warhol Museum keeps all of Warhol's boxes, because they have the same condition that Warhol had. They have to insist on the meaning and beauty in all of that ephemera. They're the Warhol Museum. And like the hoarder, they worry that if they get rid of any of his stuff, they'll lose their connection to him. And can they count that stuff up and put a value on it? No, because to the hoarder, everything is of equal value. So you get into these debates, they get esoteric sometimes, but you know, standard setting, eventually the board says, all right, we gotta get to closure. We gotta make a decision. We can't just go on forever. Ron Bassio, my guide to the hearing of the FASB in 1991, when C. Douglas Dillon appeared in Norwalk, Connecticut, and stood up before the Vatican of Accounting and said, we cannot tell you what we have in our collections. That is not the way our imaginations are wired. And the Vatican backs down. The accountants realize that this is a battle they cannot win, with the result that on virtually every American art museum balance sheet, there is some version of Note A. 
in conformity with accounting policies generally followed by art museums, the value of the museum's collections has been excluded from the statement of financial position. When the moon was new and the sun young, of silver and gold the gods sung. In the green grass they silver spilled, and the white waters they with gold filled. In Tolkien's poem, The Horde, everyone who desired the treasure dies in the end, but the treasure remains, buried deep in giant warehouses in New Jersey. There is an old hoard in a dark rock, forgotten behind doors none can unlock, that grim gate no man can pass. On the mound grows the green grass, there sheep feed and the lark saw, and the wind blows from the seashore. The old hoard the night shall keep, while earth waits and the elves sleep. Revisionist History is produced by Mia Lobel and Lee Mingistu with Jacob Smith, Eloise Linton, and Anna Naim. Our editor is Julia Barton. Original scoring by Luis Guerra. Mastering by Flan Williams. Fact-checking by Beth Johnson. Special thanks to the Pushkin crew, Hedda Fain, Carly Migliori, Maya Koenig, Maggie Taylor, Jason Gambrell, and of course, El Jefe, Jacob Weisberg. I'm Malcolm Gladwell.